to initiate the meeting as usual with an acknowledgement that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I'd also like to acknowledge that many people are joining us today from other places near and far and also acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Uh, you should also note that this meeting is being recorded for archival purposes, and it will in time be posted on the website of the college, and you will receive a link to it after it has been posted. We will proceed. Uh, we have, first of all, the business section of this meeting, which will be relatively short, uh, I think about 10 minutes in order that we can stick with the schedule for the second part of our meeting, which is for Isabel McKenzie to join us uh, for her talk this afternoon. So let us move uh, immediately then to the business part of the meeting. When I signed up for this gig, I was enamored of the notion that the Emeritus College was a place for conversation and connection and camaraderie and uh, looked forward to the opportunities to meet in person with colleagues from all around the university and the campus and many different faculties. Of course, the arrival of the pandemic uh, left us staring at a, a, a virtual void as it were. And uh, one of the challenges of the last little while has been thinking about how we can hold on to many of the really important attributes and characteristics of the Emeritus College in what is becoming and really is substantially for our business, a virtual world. If you look at Wikipedia for a definition of virtual world, it will tell you that it's a computer simulated environment in which people can have a personal avatar and independently and simultaneously explore the virtual world, its activities and communicate with others and all that sort of stuff. And in some sense, that is really what we are being forced to resort to. Um, some people have pseudo avatars, at least on the screen, um, still pictures of themselves uh, when we have Zoom meetings. And uh, we have in all sorts of ways tried to find means of moving our activities into a form where people can participate simultaneously and independently. Many of you will be fans of and remember the Senior Scholars Series, which we have run in conjunction with Green College for more than a decade now, uh, but which was forced off the air, so to speak, uh, in Green College by the pandemic. Uh, we have moved that into a virtual format. Uh, that has implied some changes. Uh, we are still having conversations with selected emeritus colleagues. And this term we're featuring Tony Dawson from English, Nancy Galini from economics and Kay Teschke from population health. Uh, but each of these people is in conversation with our moderator for the series this year, Jerry Wasserman. And uh, the video for the Tony Dawson making friends with Shakespeare interview conversation with Jerry will be going up on our website uh, as soon as we can uh, get it ready to do that. So uh, these will become archived and available. And I think that the attendance has been terrific uh, so far and that people have enjoyed the new format. Uh, there was a little bit of conversation in the waiting room or while we were waiting to uh, begin about the new program, the Emeritus College Conversations, and there will be one of these a month as well through the year. Uh, these are intended to have Emeritus colleagues talk about topics that are of broad general interest. You can see on the screen the topics we have chosen for this term, and we'll have three, uh, I hope, equally broad and interesting ones for next year. Uh, the format here is three people uh, speaking from quite different perspectives in conjunction with a moderator who keeps them to time and keeps things flowing. Uh, they have a certain amount of conversation before we open it up to questions uh, from the listening group. 
And uh, I think the first of these on pandemics was uh, very well attended and quite uh, enthusiastically received. So please do take the opportunity to participate in these events. They are a little less open to casual social engagement than might have been the case if we were meeting live, but they do provide interesting fora and opportunities for engagement with colleagues and ideas. And so I think they are helping us to fill what otherwise might have been this, this pandemic co-void. I've also thought that maybe more casual conversation would be welcome. And so on Fridays at 3.30, I'm running, at least so long as people are interested, a virtual common room. And this is uh, readily available for people to drop in as they wish. And normally we uh, have no script for that. We talk about what people wish to raise. But for this Friday, and we will send out discussions, uh, details about this tomorrow, uh, we will have a discussion of the themes from Isabel's talk that is shortly to follow. So here is an opportunity to pick up some threads from what I'm sure is going to be an interesting talk and uh, we will be able to recreate perhaps something of the uh, discussion that previously was uh, occurring in the Philosopher's Cafe. Um, the other activities, obviously the general meeting is now online as today. Our next one is with Lara Boyd and there'll be more details about that at the end of the, the meeting. Uh, and we're also looking to schedule other lectures on an ad hoc basis. So we have a lot going on and I would just recommend you to check the website frequently because that's where you can find the details. This has been a very busy three months for the Emeritus College leadership. Uh, and it's not only been adapting to the COVID induced crisis, uh, we have uh, had a retreat in September and engaged in, I think, very productive discussion uh, about how this multifaceted enterprise can and should move forward most effectively and uh, productively. Uh, fundamentally, uh, we have a simple structure. Uh, there is the core group, which is the current principal, the vice principal, and the past principal, the council of nine elected members and former presidents and our hardworking office staff who support the activity. But then around that, there's the very wide and expanding penumbra of committees and interest groups who have in the past uh, generated a great deal of interest. Uh, but it seemed to me as I became principal and at the retreat, we engaged in discussion of this, that uh, this was probably a good time in the face of the disruptions that we are encountering with COVID to look at systematizing our operation to achieve certain ends. Uh, more participation, more engagement, but uh, a form of devolved governance if possible so that all of the work didn't always come back to the office staff and the core group of the principals and council. Uh, we are progressing with that and uh, we will be organized around three axes, programs, retirement matters and activities. Uh, we will be discussing these proposals in more detail again at the meeting of the council in a couple of weeks. And uh, if the general principles are approved, we will be moving on to uh, specify clearer protocols and appointment terms for the operations of this multifaceted enterprise that the ever vigorous emeriti are turning the emeritus college into. So thank you for all of that. And I would simply stress the importance of participation by as many people as possible to sustain the energy and activity of our group. Finally, let me just as a matter of housekeeping business, draw your attention to the upcoming deadline for nominations for our two major awards offered by the Emeritus College. Uh, the President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emeriti, 
that has been running for a couple of years uh, now, and uh, we have had any number of nominations of people doing wonderful things in the way of service to communities near and far. And we will continue that. Nominations close on December the 4th. And this year we have a new Emeritus College sponsored award for excellence in the innovative and creative endeavors of our Emeritus colleagues. So this is to recognize people who uh, make a mark in innovative and creative ways beyond what they were professionally practicing as a Meritai. So the psychologist who becomes uh, a painter or uh, the mathematician who becomes a poet of renown um, and others similarly are potential candidates for that award. You can find more details on the website and please put your thinking caps on and uh, send in some nominations, uh, the more the merrier in many ways for these awards. It's lovely to recognize the activities of our colleagues and uh, I'm sure that we all know people who deserve such recognition. Okay, well with that, I think I will close out the business part of our meeting and hand over the rest of this afternoon to my colleague, Bill McCutcheon from our programs committee, who is going to be master of ceremonies and introduce our speaker, Isabel McKenzie. Bill, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Well, we come now to our speaker of the day, um, Isabel McKenzie, the seniors advocate for BC. There's been a very nice write up about um, Isabel and the newsletter, letter, which uh, probably you have read already. Much more could be said about that, but I just want to say a couple of lines. Um, BC's senior population uh, is rapidly increasing from in 2013 or so, it was listed at 750,000 um, to about, and that was the year or the year later, 2014, that Isabel was appointed by the BC government as Canada's first seniors advocate. And it is projected to rise to about double that number in the next decade. So you can imagine that Isabel is very busy in this role of hers. So we very much appreciate your taking the time, Isabel, to give us this talk. Thank you very much and hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure to, I'm just gonna try and screen share here. And just a second here. Um, okay. Okay, can somebody give me a thumbs up if they see UBC Emeritus College on their screen? Brilliant, okay, this is this. So uh, first of all, okay, it is a pleasure to be speaking to uh, Emeritus professors at UBC. I'm accustomed to be on, on the other end of your, <laughs> of the table here. I spent a year at UBC in Gage Towers when I was going to change the world under the leadership of Phil Resnick, but uh, unfortunately I, I uh, has skedaddled back here to Victoria, but uh, strong connection to UBC. My father-in-law was uh, dean of one of the faculties of arts and science or something over there a gazillion years ago. So um, it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, to be speaking to you today, and, and I am appreciative of what an august group uh, I am addressing. So. Um, I'm just going to start uh, a little bit about talking about the picture of uh, seniors here in BC today, and I'm going to talk in general terms, and then we can talk a little bit about uh, COVID. So the seniors population in BC right now is 920,000 out of four, um, uh, total population of 4.8 million. These numbers shift, as you know, a bit every year, but in general, it's about 20% of our population and it's projected to rise to a peak of about 25%. I think it's going to hit its peak in about 2031, 35, um, at which point it's going to stabilize. Uh, as a proportion of the population, it will, of course, continue to grow in an absolute number. And I think what's important to reflect on is that even at uh, the apex, uh, seniors are still a minority of the population. 
And so we hear a lot of rhetoric and um, uh, apocalyptic predictions about this world forever being altered because it's going to be uh, overtaken by a bunch of gray haired people. In fact, that's not what the, what the data tell us uh, at all. And many of you will know if you look around the world, there are countries where the population has already reached the level that we will be uh, reaching. So if you look at Japan, uh, some of the Nordic countries, what's very surprising is there's a couple of South American countries with very high uh, pop population proportions over 65 right now. And their world hasn't collapsed. So I think we, uh, I do have confidence that we are going to muddle through um, and we will be able to manage uh, the challenges that lie ahead, although there is going to be uh, a change. But, you know, we've been through this change before when we saw the inversion of this pyramid at the beginning of the, of the baby boom. So I think that's important for us to keep in perspective that eight out of 10 British Columbians right now are under the age of 65. Uh, the other thing is where seniors live, and sometimes people are a little surprised uh, to look at where folks are living because there is a, a sense or a perception out there of the inevitability that uh, as we age, we are inevitably going to land up in the nursing home or long-term care, and of course that's in the news a lot uh, today. But when we look at it, uh, we find that that is uh, less likely rather than more likely. And we need to be careful that we don't focus too much attention or all of our attention on one aspect of aging and at the, um, at the expense of what is the greater uh, percentage of people and their aging experience. So at age 85, so at, nine, at 65, it's 93% uh, live independently. I look at, I use a lot of my data, I look at age 85 because that's a few things. It's the average age of a person in a nursing home in British Columbia. And when we look at some of our healthcare utilization data, it's when you start to see a, a, a much more pronounced use of the healthcare system. So at age 85 uh, plus uh, in BC, 72% of seniors live independently. And about 80% of those folks uh, are homeowners, about 20% are renters. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the shifts that you do see as we get older, we are seeing that shift from the single family home to um, uh, either a condominium or a, a, a townhouse, so multiple dwelling unit kind of environment. And I think we will continue to see that. And I think, um, you know, uh, when I reflect back to 40 or 50 years ago, 40 years ago, I guess, um, really we didn't have condominiums much in Canada. There were a few in the big cities of Toronto and Montreal, but they're a rather new phenomenon for us. Um, and so I think uh, we will continue to see uh, a, a movement of people getting out of the single family home and moving into multi-dwelling uh, uh, setting for many reasons, potentially financial, potentially ease of everything on one level with an elevator, uh, potentially a combination of uh, all of those reasons. About 10% of people 85 and over live in what is called assisted living or retirement home. It's a bit confusing in BC. The use of the term assisted living has a very specific use that I think uh, most people think of a lot of places as uh, assisted living when in fact they're not registered. So I think an example I would use for is tapestry out at UBC. Uh, technically not assisted living, I don't think, or at least all the units aren't, um, uh, but looks and feels like assisted living. And that's really just a, a, a thing about, you know, who's providing any care. But uh, so I've lumped them together. It's basically 10% of people over 85 are living in a, a communal-like environment. And 15% uh, of people 85 and over live in long-term care. Um, that's 85 and over. And what we've identified through our data are that about 15 to 20% of those people could live in a less acute environment. Some could live in the community. Uh, almost all of them could live in assisted living if we had it. Uh, but we've got some challenges with only one level of 
care of licensed care that we have in the province. And we used to have different levels. Uh, the median income, this isn't household income, this is individual income, is 28,000, uh, we'll call it $29,000. What's important is um, to recognize the degree of poverty that we have amongst our seniors. And what you see is a, 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 a sort of, at the, at the bottom end, 20% of seniors are living on uh, $18,000 a year. And then at the upper end, the top 20% are living on an average of 80,000. Now that's an average, right? So there's obviously much higher. That's quite a wide gap. And we know that there's about a third of our seniors on the Guaranteed Income Supplement or GIS. Now that doesn't tell us what their assets are, that's fair. But I think it's also fair to say that anybody with significant assets outside of their uh, home, their primary residence, is going to produce an income from those assets and you're going to see that reflected and so they're not going to qualify for GIS. So there is certainly a group of uh, not an insignificant number of BC seniors for whom uh, uh, sufficient income is a challenge and it can be, it's a challenge that many can meet until they have a health crisis that we don't see as health, so we don't pay for it, but they have costs that they uh, now, need to, now need to cover. 15% um, uh, of people over 65 are employed. 30% uh, of uh, people 65 to 69 are employed. That number is growing. And you know, it's a funny thing. I, I don't know what the particulars were at uh, UBC, but I was on the Board of Governors at uh, University of Victoria. And as you know, the province eliminated the ability for employers to have mandatory retirement. Many employers never had mandatory retirement, but those who did were no longer allowed to have mandatory retirement. And where uh, there was a big impact was actually in the academic community. And so I think it was about five years ago was the last time I was, I think, because I'm not on the board any longer. Um, we had at UVic something like 150 or 200 professors that were turn tenured professors that were turning uh, 65 and about four were planning to retire. And so you can see the, the downward pressures in the academic world um, that that it could potentially uh, create in terms of spaces. But I think that what's important to recognize is that we are living longer, we are living healthier, and outside the world of academia, um, most of us are taking uh, longer before we really launch on our permanent attachment in the labor force because we're taking more training um, and more post-secondary um, learning. And so the math around years in retirement versus years working uh, toward in, uh, retirement requires a certain um, ba actuarial balance in order to be sustainable. And the days of enjoying you know, uh, 40 years of retirement on 30 years of working, we know that's not uh, going to be sustainable. So it's important, I think, to, to recognize that um, uh, we are going to work longer as we as we age and, and whether we want to look at this magical number of 65. Um, take a little look at the uh, seniors population and um, what their uh, health is like. One of the things I draw your um, attention to is, oh, apologies, um, is the um, dementia. So under 65, 1% of the population has a diagnosis of dementia. At 65 plus, uh, it is 6%. Uh, conversely, that means 94% of people over 65 don't have a diagnosis of dementia. Even between the ages of 65 and 84, um, uh, that is 3% uh, of the uh, population. And it's really when you hit 85, Again, the mat you see it, but um, one you know it, it how you express a number forms the narrative. I don't know how many of you have followed. There was a 
book, uh, The Undoing Project, by a couple of Israeli psychologists, Daniel Canahan and I can't remember the second name. Um, and they talked about uh, one of the examples they used was if you take two groups of people and you express mortality as 90% chance of survival uh, versus 10% chance of death, more people are, will opt when you express it as 90% chance of survival than 10% chance of death. And this is not dissimilar to how we are expressing um, some of our dementia data. So it is true at 85 plus, uh, one in five have a diagnosis of dementia, but that means four, in, four out of five don't. And so we really want to think about um, what that means. And, and people will say uh, there's uh, undiagnosed dementia, and that's true, but every disease and every illness is undiagnosed until it's diagnosed. And it is diagnosed when symptoms uh, are pronounced. And so what I say is by the time a dementia is, is profoundly affecting your ability to live independently, it actually is diagnosed. So, um, you know, we need to, to think about most people over 85 actually are number one living independently um, and living with certainly uh, a significant amount of capability and capacity. Then we look at um, use of the healthcare system and these numbers are not, I think, surprising to any of us that uh, non-users of the healthcare um, uh, system and the healthy population under 65, 60% of us just don't use the healthcare system. Um, and that, and you can see that as we get older, that number drops. So at 65, you know, the vast majority of people have formed a relationship, as we say, with the healthcare system. Um, you can see that um, during those 65 to 84 years, that it doesn't actually shift that much. It's at the higher end. So then you hit 85 plus, uh, and that's when you're really starting to see uh, a strong attachment to the uh, healthcare system. But even at that, when you look at low complexity chronic conditions, medium complexity, high complexity, yes, you are absolutely seeing what you would expect to see uh, as people age, but you are uh, still not seeing 100%. So even uh, at 85 and plus, there's as many people, there's as big a percentage of the population with low complexity chronic conditions as there are in long-term care, right? So that is sort of enlightening us in terms of um, sort of some of the sense of inevitability it really isn't quite as inevitable as we, um, as we think it is. Uh, unfortunately, um, mortality uh, is still inevitable, um, but uh, the journey toward that uh, is, uh, can be very different uh, for different people. So that's why it's, it's really important to look at alternatives to long-term care as part of the solutions. Right now, we're focused a lot on long-term care. Um, certainly in COVID, it's been a highlight, and I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. But when we talk about uh, seniors and the aging population and how do we support, it is not all about long-term care beds or more long-term care beds um, or better long-term care. That is important, um, but in fact, the vast, vast majority of us will never be in long-term care, and frankly, we won't even know somebody in long-term care. So we need to make sure that we don't lose um, the focus on better coordinated community services. So I, one of the things I talk about is a lot of people say we need more services, more this, more that. And I say, well, now just wait a minute. We have a lot of services that we offer. They are extremely fragmented, however. And so I don't believe we can know if we have sufficient or not until we've maximized the efficiency of what we do have and what we do uh, pay for. And we are a long way away from doing that. We've fragmented uh, the services within the public system and the public providers. We've fragmented it within community uh, organizations, what we call things, how people can know about it. And we have completely underestimated uh, the necessity of having somebody 
who can be the coordinator or the navigator for somebody. That just the sheer act of having to do that eliminates a lot of people. Uh, we're very good at handing out the list of here's who you call, here's, but we've underestimated that some people's capacity for what we call executive function uh, is more limited than others, and they simply can't cope with that. We also need more support for family caregivers, and there's no doubt the system collapses on itself without family caregivers. That's the, this is the only area that I will use big dramatic terms, in part because um, I, I just don't think, I think the world divides into two groups. Those who have been a significant family caregiver to an aging spouse or parent, and those who've not, who have not. And I think um, the day-to-day -day, um, burden of uh, being that caregiver is not necessarily appreciated. Uh, one of the observations, both professionally and personally, is that giving, a, giving people relief from being with the person they're providing the care for is one of the things uh, that can make uh, life much more tolerable. And um, we're not doing that uh, as well as we should. In BC, we also need more affordable home support. Our province is unique. We charge for our public home support. Um, so people think, oh, well, you know, the government will provide in-home care if you need it. Uh, yeah, but we're going to charge you for it. So if you're, if you're very low income, your GIS actually you're exempt from the copayment. So that's a third of the seniors are exempt from the copayment. Um, but uh, if you are even one dollar over the threshold, which means you don't get GIS, we're going to come in with a formula that basically wants you to, pay, to spend up to 50% of your income. So to put it in practical terms, a, a senior with an income of 27,800 a year is expected to pay $8,800. That would get them one hour a day. Uh, home support. And so I think we can all agree that that, uh, and, and the data support, I mean, when you, when you find that it, people in receipt of GIS are five times more likely to use public home support, and you know, what's the difference? There's no health status difference. What's the difference? They don't have to pay for it and everybody else does. Um, I think that uh, the argument becomes uh, compelling. And I think that's part of, it's not the only reason, it's part of that 15% of long-term residents uh, who could be living in the community. We actually, from the consumer's perspective, we make it cheaper to go into long-term care than stay at home and get home support. But from the public funding system, it's more expensive. Um, because the, on average, a long-term care bed costs taxpayers $28,000 more than two hours of daily home support. So it's an end. And the other thing is we need more choice and affordability in assisted living. Um, if you have the money to go to tapestry either uh, on the UBC campus, or I've been at the one on the U in Yokevit, uh, Oak, uh, no, okay, the O'Keefe site, uh, U and, anyhow. Um, I, it, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I'd move in tomorrow. Not sure where my husband would go, but I would move in tomorrow. Um, and I may be able to afford that. But uh, a lot of people can't. And we offer very little subsidized assisted living. And I have been um, argue, uh, advancing the argument um, that we need to be looking at that even more so than we look at long-term care beds. And all you do is look at the waiting list. Um, so it's like 15% uh, of long-term care beds have somebody waiting for them, but 30% of our subsidized assisted living units have somebody waiting for them. So on the sheer, looking at the, uh, at the map of it, the argument would be made that you, you have to relieve the pressure on the demand for, uh, it's more acute on a subsidized assisted living. So let's look at the impact of COVID. Um, and you know it's going to be very interesting uh, for uh, research people like myself who sort of like to look at the. I mean, there's just a whole lot of things we want to to um, study, which that we know we can't meaningfully even start to study until three or four years out as we look back on this. And uh, <laughs> we 
we may be asking ourselves some questions about just what exactly were we thinking at the time, but we'll see. Um, because this whole issue of unintended consequences uh, is really starting to come a bit to the forefront. And I think it's because when we started uh, this, uh, certainly I, I can't speak for others, uh, did not have any um, uh, under, understanding or I, I just simply did not believe that seven months later we would still be uh, in the degree of, of sort of restrictions that we find ourselves in trying to control this virus. And so when you're doing something that you think you're going to have to put in place for two or three months, that's one thing. But when you're looking at something that's looking like it's going to maybe have to be a year and a half, you're starting to look at some other issues. So, um, you know, we look at what did we do when the pandemic, well, we closed all the fitness centers, so all the recreation centers, all the senior centers, all the libraries, all the areas where people could socialize were all closed uh, for three months. Um, I still can't figure out why it's taken forever for the libraries to open, but uh, slowly they're, they're opening. I was here in Victoria, I think they've just opened uh, some of them. May, I think they've, they've now got all the branches open. Um, and so what has been the consequence of that, telling people to stay home? I mean, it's one thing when it's two or three months, but it's another thing when it's 18 months. So we're going to have to, to look at the impact of that. Um, we also, for the two to three months of the pandemic, um, certainly, uh, you know, ally, what we would call ally health. So lots of seniors need foot care and they uh, need physiotherapy and they need, all of those were effectively cut off. Now, most of that has come back. So my prediction is that we will not be able to detect in the data uh, a discernible uh, pattern based on the two to three months that those were not offered. Um, primary care physicians, uh, still are pivot, pivoted to virtual visits. Ironically, uh, this may be something where there's an unintended positive uh, from this versus a consequence we don't know. Have uh, by forcing physicians into a world of offering virtual visits, are we actually increasing the access to physicians by seniors who would find it difficult to get in the car and get to the doctor's office, but they can sit with their daughter on a Zoom call and, and get the diagnosis or the help or the prescription from the, um, the surgeon we'll have to, or from the doctor. We'll have to, we will, we're probably a year away from being able to really effectively study that. Um, surgery, uh, as you know, we canceled, I believe, uh, postponed or canceled 40,000 surgeries. We're getting that back on board. I think there is a huge uh, recognition. Well, okay, I'm not sure what the public recognition is. I think most of us realize that we sat with 4,000 empty beds uh, for quite a while. Uh, we didn't know what was coming our way. Uh, we had to create room, and we did create room. But I think we recognized uh, you can't sustain that going forward. It's why we're looking every day at the hospitalization rate. That's the big number that we want to look at uh, versus the test positive uh, COVID. Uh, and right now, uh, to give you some idea, our five-day rolling average of positive tests is, is well above our peak back in um, uh, April, but our hospitalization rate is half or less than half what it was. So. Uh, you know, if we can keep, and even at our peak, I think we only ever had 140 people at any one time in the hospitals, pardon me, and we can, uh, we can, we manage that and we could manage more without turning the system on its head. And I think that they've recognized that when it comes to uh, acute care, uh, they're going to manage it uh, more localized. So. For example, if Surrey Memorial um, has a, a surge on beds due to COVID, uh, the surgeries there may be delayed or canceled, but they wouldn't be a province-wide uh, edict. And we're also waiting to see in, we're very worried, as you know, about uh, flu season, and the pattern is very clear that the peak demand on the hospital system from the flu 
uh, comes in the latter part of December, January, and February. And that's a pretty consistent historical pattern. Um, and we, we know that uh, the southern hemisphere doesn't always replicate itself in the northern hemisphere. It often does, but not always. Uh, we also know that a lot of the measures we're taking to contain COVID will also uh, contain influenza. And we probably heard we've ordered a, a gazillion <laughs> doses of flu vaccine, and you'll hear campaigns to get people vaccinated. For me, you'll continue to hear that the best way to keep senior state safe is to get yourself vaccinated because, of course, the efficacy of the vaccine is, uh, is stronger in younger immune systems. Um, so we'll have to see where we, uh, uh, how we're going to manage our hospital system over the next uh, few months. The news out of the Southern Hemisphere, by the way, is good. Um, whether that translates to here or not we, uh, remains to be seen. Um, our home and community care, we did home nursing care continued, home support uh, continued, adult day programs were shut. Uh, they're slowly coming back, very, very slowly. I'm, I'm watching that indicator very carefully. Adult day programs, for those of you who don't know, is a program where a person usually, but not always, with uh, dementia or they might have a, a pro profound physical uh, impairment, they would go for the whole day to a center where they would get a meal and they would get sometimes bathing and they, and their caregiver, if they had a co-residing caregiver and about 70% of them do, uh, basically has the day free. And ideally uh, people could go to adult day programs about three days a week. I don't think we've quite got that average here. But we're gonna be looking at whether we've seen a higher rate of admissions to long-term care corresponding to closures of adult day programs because uh, care uh, uh, home caregivers were no, were no longer able to, to uh, cope. Um, congregate care settings, assisted living, independent living. Um, there was some disruption uh, regarding new admissions and people moving, but of course uh, that has abated to some degree. The visiting uh, was absolutely an issue in the assisted living and independent living sites. That's eased a little bit, and it's eased a little bit more than we're seeing in long-term care, where the visit restrictions for some, uh, certainly it's still only one designated visitor, and then for some it is um, the frequency of those visits and the duration and location of those visits is not uh, what they need to be. So we're gonna see them now. So a bit of a COVID-19 snapshot, and I, this is pretty recent. It may be from, from yesterday. If not, it's from the day before. Uh, so um, we've had 9,000 uh, cases to date. Uh, it has been interesting. I probably should have put this in a graph for you uh, to graph the, the changing demographics of uh, who's contracting the virus over time. Um, so if we look at the, at the distribution of the cases by age. 19% um, of the cases were, are in the population 60 plus, but that's 26% of the population. So they're not, um, they're disproportionately uh, lower than, uh, if you looked at this back in May, it was the other way around. And that reflected what we were seeing in our uh, long-term care assisted living uh, population. Um, 80 plus, a little bit closer proportionate, 6% uh, of the cases and 5% of the population. Uh, as of September 29th, which was yesterday, 4.30, um, 69 people were hospitalized. Uh, now this is where you now see the disproportionate burden on the older population. So 65% uh, of the people hospitalized are 60 plus. Um, and I'm just adding that doesn't add to 65. 20% are 60 to 69. Uh, oh, okay, that's a breakdown of the 65, okay. So 20% uh, are 60 to 69, 24% are 70 to 79, and 22% are 80 plus, which is actually not, uh, that's a fairly even distribution amongst uh, those age groups. 
Um, in the ICU, again, um, we see that within the group that's been hospitalized, um, uh, the disproportionate number that go to the ICU are age 60 plus. And then um, where you really see um, the magnitude of the severity of the illness is in the death, uh, the mortality rates. So 96% of the deaths were in people 60 plus, although they are only 19% of the caseload. So, you know, that's just some numerical expression of what we have been told, that this is a more serious illness for older adults. Um, 151 of the people who have died were residents of long-term care. That's 61% of all deaths. Uh, that is, um, you know, one of the things I, I try to remind people of is that for some people who are living in long-term care, um, not all, but some, they are very much near the end of their life. And some of them are actually at a, they, in their medical orders for scope of treatment, they've, they've got a do not treat order. There's sort of levels of intervention. And by the time somebody has said, do not treat me for anything, you know, forget the DNR, the intubation, the hospital transfer, don't even give me antibiotics. Um, uh, by that time, a person really is at end of life. And so one of the issues, I don't know who out there um, from epidemiology, but or public health, but one of the things we look at, there's both uh, uh, lives lost, but also years of life lost. And so that's where when we look at COVID, um, and certainly when we look at the deaths, one of the question is, what were the years of life lost? And that becomes important when we're looking at um, living with something for a year and a half to two years, what restrictions we want to have in place and what are unintended consequences. It's actually quite important to have the slightly uncomfortable conversation about um, how many of the deaths were people who were literally in their final weeks of life and what, because we have to ask ourselves, what, who are we saving um, and what is the cost of saving that? Of saving that person. Those are very, very difficult uh, conversations to have. And if we were only talking about a two or three month pandemic, that would be one thing. But as I say, we've got to think very carefully about the long term impacts of some of these things. Um, okay, so uh, another interesting thing to look at um, we have 560 long term care and assisted living sites that are under the provincial health officers' orders. Um, uh, around the single site, for example, and, and also under visit restrictions. Um, that represents about 40,000 uh, people, about, uh, um, uh, and most of those, about 20, about 30,000 are in um, long-term care and about uh, 8,000 some, so about 32,000 are in long-term care, 8,000 some are in the registered assisted living which is not the same as the seniors independent living. 55 facilities out of the 560, so slightly less than 10% so far, have experienced an outbreak. Uh, most have been in long-term care, 55 in long-term care and six in assisted living. It's 61 outbreaks because some facilities have experienced more than one outbreak. They had an outbreak, outbreak was declared over, they had another outbreak. 37 of the outbreaks had no deaths. So currently, uh, that is more than half. 28 of the outbreaks to date have been contained to a single staff member. That is also uh, important. One of the things we did at the very beginning was lower our threshold for declaring an outbreak to one uh, test positive case, resident or staff. And in the previous world of outbreaks before COVID, um, we, don't, we would require two cases, one laboratory confirmed before we would uh, declare an outbreak at a care home for something like influenza, norovirus, et cetera. Um, seven were contained to a single resident, and, and I'm a bit curious about that one. We're going to try and, and drill down because where did the resident get it from uh, is one of the big questions. Uh, so, uh, and it's, positive, it's possible that some of these uh, single staff or single resident cases were false positive. False positive is possible, 
It's far less probable than a false negative on the test that we have, but it is possible. Um, five of them were contained to two to five residents or staff, so that is what we would call a contained outbreak. Uh, Ten involved uh, between six and 15, and that's starting to get a little out of control in an outbreak. And certainly once you get beyond 15 and beyond, we, we call that outbreak, um, uh, we call it out of control in my world. We're not used to talking publicly about these things, but that's how we would describe it. It sounds very dramatic. Um, currently, we have 12 active outbreaks in long-term care and assisted living homes, and I, the majority of those are currently single staff members. 6% um, of the cases uh, have occurred in publicly operated care homes and 84% in the contracted care homes. And the contracted can be either a not-for-profit or a for-profit. And within the contracted homes, uh, there's different patterns. I think the number of outbreaks may, it's either pretty equal or slightly on the side of the uh, private. But when you look at the number affected, so the big outbreaks, uh, that clearly uh, tilts over to the not-for-profit because we've had some big ones at uh, Harrow Park, Lynn, um, uh, Langley Lodge, Holy Family, and New Vista. Um, and then 10% in the fully private uh, long-term care homes. We don't have many of those in uh, British Columbia, but there are a few out there. Um, 656 cases in total. Um, 389 residents and 267 staff. You will hear from the PHO in some of her updates a, a, a different number, a higher number, um, because she's clumping together uh, acute care and some of the, there's a couple of settings that really aren't senior settings, but they're under uh, CC, the Community Care Assisted Living Act. So her number is slightly different and slightly bigger but these are the numbers uh, in long-term care and assisted living. Now the graph at the bottom um, is interesting. So if you look over here, this is at the beginning. This, this line, uh, let me get my lines here. Okay, this darkest line here, these are outbreaks. So you can see how you know, it started off, it went up, 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 up. It stayed at a high level pretty much over April, uh, it started to dip down a little bit in, in and into May, and then you know started to go quite down, a little bit of a plateau, down again, and now we've seen it start to go up again. But look at the delta between that line and this line here, the bottom line, which is outbreak is a single staff member. And that delta is quite big here, um, but it is not that big here, right? Um, so that is good news in telling us that uh, we are containing it. And then the other one is the five-day rolling average case number. So again, the delta, and here you see an inversion. So what you see back at the, at the height was here was our, our um, apex of our case uh, positive, test positive cases, case numbers. Um, and if you, we went, you know, way, 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 way above that, right? And then you look here, now it's inverted, and now our five-day rolling average is uh, up, above. And so, uh, you know, I think what that case, and you've heard Bonnie talk about this, certainly at her, at her briefings, and those of you in public health, I mean, you'll know that the case number is only one piece of information. Um, it's who are those people, where are they, you know, and what's happening in our, in our long-term care homes. And most uh, uh, importantly is the number of times we are managing to contain the outbreak to a single staff member, because that tells us that our detection system uh, is working. And if you can contain it to a single staff person, you will be able to contain the outbreak in that care home. If you discover the outbreak by the time several people are infected, it is going to uh, get away from you very quickly. Um, so issues in long-term care, um, this is sort of a backdrop. Um, 
you know, these issues all existed before COVID. COVID has uh, highlighted the consequences of some of these issues when there's an emergency. Um, and there's a, a report that you're welcome to read called A Billion Reasons to Care that my office uh, put out in February of this year. It's on our website. Um, that, that looks at this uh, $1.4 billion uh, dollar, uh, sector of contracted long-term care in the province and where the money is going and uh, where we need openness and transparency around our reporting. And I think that um, with, with the revelation of uh, life in long-term care uh, that has resulted from COVID, uh, the, the COVID exposure, <laughs> pardon the pun, um, I think that we're going to see more attention being paid to uh, a number of these issues. Okay, that's my presentation and I'm happy to, I'll stop sharing and I will turn it back over to you guys. I can't hear anybody. So I think, there, yeah, there you I go. I did unmute and then it muted itself again. <laughs> so. Can you hear me now, Isabel? I can hear you now, Bill. Good. Well, thank you very much, Isabel, for this very, very interesting talk. Um, I found that the um, tables you showed with all those numbers uh, was, was very, very interesting and um, gave a portrait of uh, the various demographics, the age uh, categories in BC. And uh, I'm sure it found a very attentive audience here at, uh, in the Professors Emeriti. So, um, I would like to uh, look over the questions here in the chat box, if you would uh, answer, take a few minutes to answer some of them. Um, how many people in BC are 85 plus? And uh, what is the percentage of the 920,000? 920, uh, I believe that 3% of the population is 85 plus. So that would be 3% of 920,000. So uh, nine times three is, uh, yeah. what is that, 20, 20 1, About 30,000 or so, yeah. 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 Good, well, um, and how many people 85 plus are living with a life partner? Uh, so at the age of 85, now, I don't know about a uh, partner. What I can tell you without having to go back and, and dig through it is that 41% uh, of people living independently live alone at the age of 85. So uh, the reverse of that would be 59% of people at the age of 85 are still are living with somebody else. I think it's predominantly still a spouse, uh, but at some, at some point it could be an adult child. Did the lockdown on homes um, reveal a gap between what a regular visitor had been doing for a, uh, for a resident and what the home itself was able to provide? I, I missed the very first part of that question, well, Bill. Did the lockdown on homes oh. reveal a gap between what regular visitor have been doing for a resident and what the home itself was able to provide? Um, we're going to know that uh, over the next two weeks. So we've got a survey out right now uh, for uh, family members and residents of long-term care and assisted living. I think we've had about 13,000 responses. So we've got a very robust data set. And um, we have asked the very questions. What, uh, what did you or what did your loved one do for you before COVID, uh, you know, and what's happening? So we're gonna get um, a picture of uh, to what degree did family caregivers go in every day and do. Now, one of the things I've had a little peek, I had a preliminary peek at some of the data. Um, and so I think that one of the things that will be loud and clear is that there still is a percentage of people in long-term care that don't have any family coming to visit them all the time, right? Or so, uh, which is also helpful in, in my opinion, in trying to solve the visitor problem because I think this notion that these floodgates are going to open and in is going to pour everybody 
uh, is not borne out when you start to, you know, the people who didn't visit, who didn't get visitors before aren't going to get visitors now. Um, so I, but I think we're going to be surprised at the degree to which some of these family members, because we asked them, what did you do for your loved one, right? And the next question, the next logical question is going to be, so when they didn't do it, who did? Uh, because there's the same number of staff um, and uh, arguably even a little less as we had to grapple with some, um, you know, our threshold for staying home is so low now that, that you actually should see an increase in um, sick leave or you actually aren't staying home um, at as low a threshold as you say you should. So I think we'll know that, uh, Bill, and I think, you know, there will be people who will describe weight loss, who will describe um, reduced mobility. So if we think about what are the kinds of things, um, you know, it's very, di it's difficult to measure mood. Uh, we try, it's an imprecise science. Um, we can absolutely measure weight. It's a little more precise on some mornings than I would like it to be. Um, but um, we can measure uh, mobility to a large extent. You know, what could you walk what distance could you walk before? What distance can you walk now? And that those areas, I think we are going to see decline. I think um, the ones that are, uh, mobility is probably the one that is going to be, that is going to find the most difficulty reversing. Um, mood, you can, uh, if we had the visits back the way, uh, but I think that's been part of the struggle. Um, is the people who were getting their stuff every day. So anyhow, we'll, I'll know, and I'm, I will be releasing a public report on that at the end of October. Um, how many of the LTC residents were inadequately nourished and or, or sorry, yes, inadequately nourished and or hydrated at the time of COVID? I don't know the answer to that. Um, what I can tell you is we did a very comprehensive long-term care survey three years ago of residents and family members. We went to every care home in the province uh, and asked, uh, mailed out a survey to every uh, identified uh, most frequent visitor. And we had 10,000 responses from residents and 10,000 responses from family members. So again, robust data set. Um, 33 or 34% uh, said that they did not get sufficient help with eating. So that's not a direct answer to the malnutrition question, uh, but it is an answer to, there is an issue in long-term care with residents um, being able to have the kind of uh, support they need in order to eat. Uh, it was also the same observation from family members. We do weigh people as part of our uh, long-term care assessments. We don't do it every day. Um, and we are going to look at that data bill, but it's going to take a while because we don't, we only do long-term, we only do inter-eye assessments every quarter. So, you know, we would take a weight in one quarter and we would take a weight. So depending on when those measurements were taken, you may need a couple of quarters of the data to show um, what the impact was, but we are going to be looking at that. And then of course it also depends, you know, the expectation was that if the care home wasn't in, a, in outbreak, they continued to do the assessments that they needed to do. So I'm hoping those assessments will be there. Okay, after health workers were limited to serving only one LTC facility, the outbreaks declined. Do we have any statistics on cases of COVID-19 among those receiving daily home care? And is there any, uh, I'm sorry, I lost that. Is there any correlation with multiple homes visited by healthcare workers? So um, the first short answer I can give is that within the public home care system, we had no outbreak or cases of COVID, uh, number one. Number two, the sink, what they call the single site order was one of the contributing factors, uh, but is not the only reason why we, we contained our outbreaks in long-term care for a multiplicity of reasons. Um, first, I think was that BC, uh, we had the first care home outbreak in Canada. We had the first death in Canada. And our public health officer, Bonnie Henry, um, quickly acted 
to recognize, as she more diplomatically put it, the fragility of our long-term care system, what, you know, fragmentation and the con She knew all of that. She knew that we had to get in there right away. We've got a coordinated healthcare system. So getting in, um, declaring outbreaks on one case with, rather than waiting for two, cohorting uh, test positive residents, um, screening, I've got a bit of a disagreement around our testing, but certainly screening and focusing on staff as the vectors of transmission. Uh, we got in there very early on that. And I think that helped us contain it. We also just had lower rates of transmission in BC period than other jurisdictions during that time. And so that also had a domino effect that the probability that the care worker was going to contract COVID was much less in British Columbia than in Ontario or Quebec, for example, or even in Alberta. And so that also lowered uh, the number of cases we had. So it was a, a number of, you know, all those factors combined to produce the result that where I think we are showing better results than most of the other provinces. And one person wants to know, is the survey going to family members or those who are in long-term care homes who died during the COVID um, outbreaks and that death was not due to COVID? They, there are definitely impacts for my mother. That's what yes, so the survey, um, this is not a mail out survey. We had to deal with the time uh, crunch that we had and the urgency of getting this information out. So this is an online survey that people you could go and you could do it up until midnight tonight. Um, we have been assured that notification has been sent to family members um, through a variety of channels. It's not as absolute uh, as I would like it to be uh, in terms of, you know, having a name and an address and mailing it out. But given the response rate we've had, I, I think a lot of family members have managed to find it. In that survey, um, you are asked if your loved one passed away. Um, now, the person who asked that question has raised a good point, which is now too late for me to address in the public at large, which is I could have made it more clear that if your loved one passed away, you can still answer the survey because if they passed away during the COVID restrictions, we wanted to understand what that experience was. So 141 people as of 4.30 yesterday had died in our long-term care homes from COVID. During the same period of time, approximately 3,700 will have died from things other than COVID, right? So that is a very important uh, perspective to have and to understand we have a whole set of questions uh, if the response is my loved one died of something other than COVID to find out what that experience was like for them. And uh, one person wants to know, what can we learn from First Nations about wise elder advisory groups? Do you have an advisory group? Um, I do have a council of advisors. Um, it's a group of 30 uh, men and women from across the province. Um, although we're going through a, a, it's been five years, so we're now looking at it. It's a large group of people uh, to try and get meaningful input from. So we may be making some adjustments there. Um, so yes, I do have uh, that council of advisors, but the question around the elders um, and our indigenous uh, community in British Columbia, we just, I think, have a lot to learn from that community about the reverence um, with which uh, the older population is held. Like they're, they're I mean, we, there's just much more um, concern for, and, and it, it's not even about, it's not a paternalistic uh, type of concern. It's a reverence for the elders. What do the elders think? What do the, right? It's not, that's why they take care of their elders uh, because they hold them in such high esteem, which is different from taking care of somebody because you feel they need to be taken care of, a more paternalistic approach. And so I think there's a lot to learn uh, in, in terms of um, 
how we view uh, the, the role of older people. So that's one box. And then the other box, and I think there's some one interlinked, uh, but there's a lot more intergenerational um, living in the Indigenous community. Now that may, you know, that may wash out in another couple of generations. I don't know. That may be related, um, and I suspect is more related to life uh, on reserve um, versus in the wider community. Um, and so as that that may not hold the sort of the intergenerational household, but I think the reverence with which um, elders are held is something we can learn from. Well, um, that is the end of the posted comments. Now, has anybody um, would like? To, is there anyone who would like to ask a question and hasn't been, hasn't had it or had time to type it up yet? There is uh, one more posted question. Yourself, yeah. There is one more posted question. Oh, I didn't see it, uh, Don. Okay, do you want to read it out? <laughs> okay, it says, apart from long-term care and COVID concerns, what other yeah. seniors' issues are likely to surface in the BC election, and how might this college contribute to the discussions? Um, well, I don't want to call. I don't want to become election fodder, so I don't want to comment on the <laughs> on the election. I think. Um, so just in, you know, getting back to uh, the earlier part of the presentation, I think the more important thing is to keep perspective and context. So uh, long-term care is important, yes. But I think there's issues, uh, um, you know, in, in practical, there's the big issue, ageism, right? And what is the, uh, and this tension between uh, the benevolent, uh, paternalistic, uh, we need to take care of uh, versus uh, I don't want you to take care of me. I can, I want to be able to take care of myself and I just want you to get out of the way. Um, there's that whole uh, discussion. But I think on a practical day-to-day -day basis, uh, what is the challenge that's different for me at 80 than at, at 50? Well, my income is like on, on a, a probability, uh, my income is likely is going to be lower and uh, I may have trouble uh, meeting some of my financial needs and there's no promotion around the corner or next plateau in my career coming that's going to boost my income up, right? So I think that that, that, is, uh, that is very real for some, for some people, more people than I think we think it is real for. Um, and then I think that sort of the and that links in other ways to some of the housing options. In parts of BC, arguably parts of Canada, I'll try not to politicize it, so in Canada, um, irrespective of how much money you have, there's the rural issue um, and what sort of housing and, and communities there can be and to meet the needs of seniors in, in rural communities when they can no longer drive their car. I think people, for example, uh, in the lower mainland and certainly over, you know, by UBC and the Dunbar area and all of that. I think the loss of a driver's license is an inconvenience and it's an adjustment to a life that doesn't have the spontaneity of getting in the car anymore. But basically there's everything within a reasonable distance. You might not be able to walk to it, but you can uh, at a reasonable cost either get yourself there or get it to you. Um, other parts of the province, uh, it's a real problem um, that when somebody's no longer able to drive. And I think we got to wrestle with that one. Self-driving cars, if they ever materialize, would have a profound impact on that. Um, and then I think, um, you know, the issues around um, what, oh, what the, how the healthcare system, I mean, it links a bit to ageism, but how the healthcare system is recognizing um, the needs of older adults. You know, one of the things I talk about is uh, go into uh, GF Strong and look at how we approach rehab with the 35 year old uh, MVA victim who comes in unable to walk, but who we know can walk, it's gonna take a year and versus the rehab unit of the hospital with the 85 year old uh, recovering from a fractured hip. And 
uh, people rise to the level of expectation in this. So our, we, we've lowered our expectation of recovery for the 85 year old. Um, we are potentially going to impede the full potential of their recovery. We don't do that with 35 year old. And so I think we may not be appreciating the degree to which uh, we're doing that. I think that one of the things the boomer generation will do, and I mean, it's carving through now 74, 75, 70, I mean, you know, the, just the sort of the whole, it's all about me um, uh, approach, I think is going to demand, they, they've demanded more of themselves. And I think they will demand that the system demand more of them as well. So I think, I hope that will improve. I don't know if that answered your question. I think I went a bit around on that. One more question has come in, uh, Isabel, and that is uh, of interest, of course, to the uh, Emeritus College members. What can we Emeritus College do to dispel ageism? Uh, well, you're doing it right now um, by making me a little bit nervous about the sharpness of some of the questions. But um, <laughs> uh, I think I think it, um, you know, part of it's collective and part of it is just individual. And I've got to be honest and say that what I've seen, sorry, uh, what I have seen over my uh, years, most particularly my years in home care, uh, and it links back a little bit to my uh, diatribe on expectations and rehab, is uh, when we as, we as individuals capitulate to aging far more quickly than we should, right? It's, I mean, this is the balancing act. I mean, at which point, you know, people, at what point do you say, okay, I've earned the right for, you know, everybody to wait on me hand and foot, um, and that's what I want. Uh, how do you weigh that against? That's not what we're meant. We're not meant to be waiting on hand and foot. We're meant to get up every day and have a purpose and do things and do things for ourselves. And the minute, you know, the more we surrender that to others to do, uh, that's a slippery slope. And that to me is the, that, that you can, lots of things you cannot, you cannot ultimately predict who's going to actually get full blown Alzheimer's. You cannot predict who's uh, going to be rendered um, unable to walk. You can, there are some things where you can see patterns of people who uh, will have cognitive decline. They won't necessarily have Alzheimer's or dementia because they're just not exercising their mind. The same with their body um, and the attitude. And you can see all of that. Um, and I don't know how you turn that around because it's true throughout life, but your attitude toward aging uh, is going to shape the aging uh, trajectory for you to a great degree. And, you know, at the end of the day, I guess it's an individual choice. But what we want to make sure is that the people who want to go forward don't get pulled back, right? Again, expectations. We want to make sure that we create, I mean, I'm talking to a bunch of superstars. So think about, you've all experienced it in your life. You were all, uh, you know, in the top of your class at some, uh, at some point and maybe continually. Um, and you know that pressure to, uh, you know, be at the norm and the pulling, you know, we call them in industrial, uh, I did a bit of study in industrial psychology and, you know, you call them the rate. So who do we hate on the factory line? We hate the people, the laggards, and the rate busters, we used to call them, right? So you don't like the people who set the bar too high because then you are expected to reach that bar, and you don't like the people who set it too low because you, you don't, want, don't want to be dragged down. But in the aging process, we have to allow these people, you just want, we want to be careful that we don't drag people that, no, 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 right? It's, it, there really is a, a tremendous degree of how we as individuals approach aging. And it, it's going to shape how you experience aging. And I just have more, I have confidence that 
the newer generations coming up um, that are just starting to push at it are going to raise the bar a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, um, a number of people have left in the last few minutes. Uh, is it <laughs> No, I just meant that they left messages saying that it's just been an outstanding presentation and they just want to thank you. Um, okay. If this were an in-person meeting, I'm sure you'd get a, an enormous round of applause. So thank you for a most interesting meeting. Okay, well, my pleasure and thank you all. And uh, I, I, I'm quite touched that you want to hear from me because I hold my professors in high esteem. It is not always reciprocated. <laughs> oh, before, <laughs> uh, before we everybody leaves, uh, Sandra has uh, some information to show you. So take note of the upcoming meetings and note uh, especially that the um, next general meeting is November the 25th at 1.30.